Well, it's noon hour, and this is Saskatchewan, so we're very prompt in this province. We'll get us rolling. My name is Michael Atkinson. I'm the executive director of the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy here at the University of Saskatchewan, and we have a campus at the University of Regina. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the U of S World Water Week lecture series co-presented with the CBC. In honor of United Nations World Water Day on March the 22nd, we're holding a public lecture series here at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan featuring some of our top researchers and invited experts who will be presenting and are, have been presenting on uh, some of the most pressing water issues facing the globe. Water security, as I think many of you know, is a signature area of the university and we aim to be among the very best in the world in the study uh, and uh, the conduct of research in this area. So much is going on in water research at the University of Saskatchewan that in, in spite of the fact there's only a water day, we, we've designated an entire water week. In fact, this week marks the official launch of the Global Institute for Water Security, which was approved last week by University Council as a research center. And the new research institute represents a $30 million joint initiative partners being the uh, Government of Canada, the Government of the Province of Saskatchewan, and the University of Saskatchewan. Now before I introduce our, our speakers for today, I'd like to point out the beautiful images of water-related paintings that you've been watching for the last few minutes. They, uh, they come from the university's art collection. Water in all its diverse manifestations and settings is a theme that runs through Saskatchewan painting, as I know most of you are aware. A special thanks to Kent Archer, director and curator of the university's art collection and galleries for putting together this wonderful sampling of water-related watercolors. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Pomeroy and Dr. Patricia Gober this afternoon. They'll be presenting two talks around the central theme of climate uncertainty, what it means for water planning and policy, recent results from Saskatchewan and Arizona. We'll take questions at the end of both presentations, so Dr. Pomeroy and Dr. Gobo will make their presentations and there'll be a little bit of time at the end for, for, for uh, questions. First of all, let me introduce uh, Dr. John Pomeroy. He holds a PhD in Agricultural Engineering and a BSc in Honours in Geography from the University of Saskatchewan. He is the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change and is a Professor of Geography and a Director, the Director of the Centre for Hydrology at the University of Saskatchewan. He's also a member of the Board of Directors of the, Canada, of the Western Watersheds Climate Research Collaborative in Canmore and at the U of S is a member of the Executive Committee on that Global Institute of Water Security I just mentioned. In addition, he's an honorary professor at the Centre for Glaciology, Aberyst with University Wales, and an Institute Professor of, for Biogeoscience bio Institute at the University of Calgary. His current interests are um, on the impact of land use and climate change on cold and semi-arid region hydrology, snow physics, mountain hydrology, and hydrological predictions in ungauged basins. When John first came to the University of Saskatchewan, I was told he was a snowman, which I did a double take on, but now you understand. He's authored over 200 research articles and several books, conducted research in Western and Northern Canada, the United States, Bolivia, Russia, Wales, Scotland, and on and on. And he just tells me he just came back from Libya. So won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. John Pomeroy. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a great delight uh, to be giving a talk in Convocation Hall. I started off as an undergraduate at this university in 1979. I may have written some exams in here back then, but uh, always uh, delighted by the, the hall and its architecture. And so it's a great honor to be doing this. Anyway, um, what I want to talk to you about is really a little bit of the uh, history of what's been found in hydrology research at this university uh, since hydrology really started in Saskatchewan back in the early 1960s. And so this is a follow-on of the uh, work of the Division of Hydrology, Don Gray, Don Norum, David Mayo, many others, uh, Jack Wiggum, who worked uh, for many years on this. And so we're really building upon a vast body of research over that period, over uh, these many years. The, it's important to realize that uh, Saskatchewan at this university is considered one of the birthplaces of hydrology in Canada. And, uh, and so it's with absolute great delight uh, 
that were welcoming Dr. Weider, Dr. Gover, and others coming in as part of the Global Institute for Water Security. This is really fulfilling a long-held dream uh, that this university should be absolutely preeminent in water research. So I want to talk about some of the uncertainty that uh, climate changes and climate variability introduces uh, to prairie water. And uh, first, I would like to uh, recognize uh, the contributors uh, who are members of the Center for Hydrology or collaborators at the National Hydrology Research Center on campus or other uh, government agencies. And two uh, very uh, important research networks which we have led out of the university. Uh, the first one, IP3, deals with cold regions hydrology in the mountains and in the north and uh, has uh, run from 2006 and will end this year. Uh, the second one, DRY, the Drought Research Initiative, is uh, dealing with recent prairie droughts, and that is ending at the end of this month. Uh, both were funded by the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences, which is wrapping up its activities this year. And both networks had about 60 to 80 uh, members, so they were uh, quite large research efforts uh, across the country. So a few concerns that we might have for prairie water. Um, we know uh, through the history of Saskatchewan, it's marked by the variability of our water supplies. The drought of the 1930s uh, left an indelible mark upon our culture, our history, our outlook, and our very way of life. The uh, floods that we have to contend with, including the tremendous flooding from last summer and the flooding that we anticipate for the spring, um, also uh, strongly mark our existence here. Over the period of settlement, warming has occurred. Uh, the winters of your grandparents were worse. And uh, even though this winter looks pretty bad, it wouldn't have stood out at all in the 1970s. And we have uh, further warming anticipated, uh, the order of three to four degrees. The big question is whether that will be accompanied by wetting or drying. And uh, this is where the climate models differ a little bit. So we, we don't really know at this point, we have to admit. Now, the warming is virtually certain. The wetting or drying is unclear. Another thing that is probably virtually certain is that our population will continue to increase. Saskatchewan's on quite a roll right now on a number of fronts, and there's no indication that's going to slow down quickly. So our needs for water resources, our use of water resources, are expected to increase. And also, as things warm up in southern Saskatchewan, the variety of crops that we can grow um, improves a bit and widens, then the, uh, uh, the need to irrigate those crops with water will become more apparent. The, uh, also, we are a uh, society and a population which puts a great value on our aquatic ecosystems and our terrestrial ecosystems that also rely on uh, surface water. And we have high demands for a high quality uh, of, of life this way, and we still remember what natural ecosystems look like in this province, and we get disturbed when they're ruined. And so our level of environmental protection is going to be much higher than other countries. If you go to Spain, it's acceptable in Spain to drain a river down to nothing, uh, to completely use it for irrigation or municipal water supply. And I don't think that would ever be acceptable here. So uh, ecosystem uh, demands and services are going to be very important. And there's a possibility to manage our watersheds for water supply under climate uncertainty. And we haven't explored this too much yet, but we're going to have to in the future. So just a little bit of hydrology 101. Water flows downhill. That's the crucial thing. If we have that, everything else works. And uh, downhill is this direction. So most of our water in the South Saskatchewan River, which is our main lifeblood in the province, uh, is coming out of the Rocky Mountains on the order of 80% out of the mountains and foothills. There's actually very little water draining off the prairies into the South Saskatchewan. So these heavy snowpacks we see in Saskatchewan this year are not going to cause a flood in downtown Saskatoon on the South Saskatchewan River. That river will peak in June when the mountain runoff starts coming through. And the mountain snowpacks so far are not above normal at all. Okay, when we look, take a look at some of the climate variability we've had, I mentioned droughts, but I remember the drought of 99 to 2004. It seems a distant memory then when Saskatoon had almost no snow in the winter and uh, things were incredibly hot in the summer, but those days weren't long ago, and that was the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. Um, if you look at this, this uh, these numbers look quite 
competitive with uh, things like the collapse of GM or something like that in terms of job losses and economic impact. And uh, Saskatchewan's recovered from that, but as everyone knows, that wasn't easy. And the other thing we know about droughts is they will come again, and we have to be ready for them when they do. Uh, some of the work that Kevin Shook has done at the university has been examining the uh, influence of wetlands on the resilience of prairie watersheds to drought. And what he's found is that in uh, basins which are dominated by wetlands, as opposed to uplands which have very few sloughs or ponds, there is a hydrological memory effect which allows these uh, areas to get through the drought without completely drying out. And this is just modeling the uh, severity of the surface hydrology in the drought. So brown is exceedingly dry, uh, blue is quite wet. Uh, for 2001, one of the worst years. So that's uh, basins that would be dominated by uplands, virtually no wetland storage. This would be basins which have a large number of wetlands in them over this prairie region in here, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And you can see the, uh, that a good half of the prairies were uh, essentially drought-proofed by the uh, presence of the wetlands in here. Those which are well-drained, the drought, surface drought was more intensive. So these are modeling results, but they can give us some water management options in here. The thing is that this memory doesn't persist forever. It uh, starts to run down after several years and is almost completely gone after six years. So a one or two year drought, this has a good effect. A 10 year drought, these wetlands will just dry out and they, they won't get us through that. They, they won't be enough. When we look at climate change, anticipated climate change impacts on prairie stream flow, we get some very strange things happening. And, uh, and these are model results, so you always have to take these with a grain of salt. But some of the uh, most reliable scenarios uh, for mid 21st and late 21st century suggest that we would be t about two and a half degrees warmer and 11% wetter by 2050, and 4.7 degrees warmer and 15% wetter by 2080. When you put these changes in and compare them to the behavior of uh, basins in southwestern Saskatchewan, you know, small coolie basins like this, then uh, we get interesting results when you compare them to, to what was happening in the 1970s. That uh, small amount of warming and a little bit of wetting causes a 24% increase in the spring stream flow by 2050. And so that's rather interesting. What's happening there is that the wetting is overwhelming the warming. And in fact, the warming in the winter is having an effect on increasing stream flow because midwinter melts are putting ice layers on top of the soil and they're keeping the snow in place from blowing around and sublimating. So it's snow staying in place, it's on top of a uh, soil with an ice layer, it runs off very easily. But then 2080, something happens. We seem to cross a threshold and instead there's a 37% drop compared to the 1970s instead of a 20% increase compared to the 1970s. So what's going on there? It's like we're going up like this and then crash. Well, what happens now is we, we no longer have a continuous winter snowpack in southwestern Saskatchewan by the 1980s. So there is the spring snowmelt just falls apart and is very small. So that's a big problem for trying to refill dugouts or sloughs or uh, feed stream flow in southwestern Saskatchewan. Uh, but it's also going to fool us because initially, with a little bit of warming, it looks like we have more water. And then a bit more warming, all of a sudden we have vastly less water. And that's dangerous because we can be tricked by this. So it's no surprise that prairie stream flow supplies are unreliable. We've known this for a long time. In fact, the Palliser expedition in the 1850s realized this. They recommended uh, lack of settlement in the uh, famous Palliser Triangle, but also realizing that they wouldn't be listened to. They were, uh, they were clever. Uh, they suggested that the Rocky Mountains be preserved for wood and water supply for the prairie settlement, which was likely to be inevitable. And uh, Western waters relied upon this water, the Alberta irrigation developments of the early 20th century, our Lake Diefenbaker development in mid-century and the irrigation which came with that, Manitoba Hydro's reservoir development in the late 20th century, the oil sands in the 21st century, and perhaps more irrigation in Saskatchewan this century. So right now, 70% uh, of the consumption of S South Saskatchewan River water goes to irrigation. So only 30% is going to cities and industries and other uses like that. Interestingly, in Alberta, 5% of farmland is irrigated, but that's 20% of the gross provincial agricultural production. 
So it's, uh, it has a tremendous economic impact and social impact, that irrigation in Alberta. In Saskatchewan, I uh, realized that less than 1% of the flow of the South Saskatchewan River originates from our province. It's coming in from Alberta. Um, but 70% of our population uses this water. Uh, remember, it's going down to Buffalo Pound Lake for Regina and Moose Jaw. It's actually feeding into the Capel system. It feeds, of course, uh, Saskatoon. And there are pipelines to many of the smaller cities in Saskatchewan now. But also, our potash industry is dependent upon it. So, uh, tremendous economic and social dependence on this water. Important to know where it's coming from. It's not coming from Saskatchewan, so where is the Saskatchewan River coming from? Well, the Rockies, uh, Banff National Park, the area is not a national park south of there. And uh, if you've gone out there to ski, you notice there's a lot of snow in the winter. Uh, heavy snowpacks in the mountains, and if you've camped there in the summer, you probably notice a bit of rain sometimes too. The Rockies are quite rainy sometimes, and uh, both generate tremendous amounts of stream flow. We also have glaciers, and they're getting smaller. They're uh, shrinking tremendously. There's a roughly 25% loss in glaciated area in the Rockies in the last quarter century, uh, which is quite fast. And if you've gone to the Athabasca Glacier, they have those markers which tell you how far where it was when you were a kid, and you probably walk a mile or two now past that marker. So it's. Um, uh, we, we're in a time of rapid glacial recession due to changing climate. The glacier ice contribution comes from the shrinkage of the glaciers, and because they don't occupy that large an area in the South Saskatchewan River Basin, it's not that large amount. It's just under 3% on an annual basis of our waters coming from glaciers. So it's really coming from snowmelt, about 60%. Now this is the flow of the Bow River in Banff, one of the major uh, headwaters of the South Saskatchewan. And you see it peaks in mid-June, tapers off, and the snowmelt period is when that river is peaking. So if we look at these snowpacks in the Rocky Mountains, if we look at snow depth in January, blue is deep. There's lots of water stored in there. So it's like having an incredible reservoir upstream of Saskatchewan, collecting our water over the winter and then releasing it in late summer. If you look in June, there's still substantial snow depth in the Rockies in many places. And the uh, timing for irrigation tends to be June. We might want it early July. That's when we really want water. And that's when that water has been coming down from the mountains. So it's a great system for water delivery for use on the prairies. And the uh, concern we have, of course, is that with changing climate, that system will change. Now, this is last year. We actually were anticipating a, a tremendous drought in May of last year. This is one of the reservoirs in the Rockies. And that doesn't look very good for uh, any kind of spring snow melt. It's a much wetter year this year, but um, I have to remember there's a lot of variability. If there's low snowfall, then we don't have the storage and we don't have the uh, hydroelectricity or the water for irrigation. Now, the um, types of snow measurements which are needed to quantify this occur at very high elevations, and they're difficult to conduct, and they're not always being very consistent. Satellite observations, though, go back to about 1970, and those are quite regular and quite consistent. And uh, this is the decline in uh, uh, number of days with spring snow cover over the year. Uh, any of these colors are declines from uh, four to two to one days per year. Anything blue is an increase. And here are the Rockies and the prairies, and so we've got a decline of about one day per year up to two days per year in that area, which means a one to two month decline in the spring snow covered period. And uh, so that means we're really getting a shift in the uh, timing of uh, snowmelt out of the Rockies since the early 1970s. So the university, uh, six years ago, established a research basin in the Rockies so we could keep an eye on what's going on there. It's called Marmot Creek. It's uh, just north of the Nikiska Ski Area. And uh, we've uh, had a lot of graduate students trained there. We've got a research base out there in the Kananaskis country and uh, we do what we think is world-class research in that environment. What we found is, uh, through some of the work Philip Harder's worked on, is a three to four degree increase in winter air temperatures at these high elevations since the 1960s. That's far more than recorded in other uh, prairie and valley bottom locations. So climate warming in the Rockies is occurring really very quickly. And when we try to model the effect on the snowpack, this is the snow water equivalent, uh, how many millimeters of equivalent depth of water there'd be on the ground. Just by putting this into a model and taking uh, the year 2006, 2007, we get a peak snow cover at the end of April and into May. 
we warm, warm it up the simulation by one degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, we see we get a collapse of the spring snowpack in the Rockies. Now, notice you warm up the winter by four degrees, nothing happens. It's going from minus 18 to minus 14. The snow says, so what? But because the Rockies get a lot of the snowfall in spring, that's spring skiing, um, then that's very susceptible to climate warming, just as much as a temperate mountain would be. And that's something we have to worry about because that snow isn't stored. If the precip would come down as rain and flush through the system much faster. But we don't have the storage to hold back those waters until the time we wish to irrigate with it. And also that loss of snowpack is going to mean a longer season for evaporation losses. So along with this, we'd anticipate about a 10 to 12 percent decrease in annual stream flow out of the Rockies and much lower uh, late summer stream flows as well. And in fact, that's what we're measuring. Uh, th these are uh, measurements of the Bull River at Banff in August from the early 1900s to the current time. And uh, they're down about 25 percent over the uh, last century. And it's, uh, statistically, it's rock solid. It's 99.9% .9 significant. So that's quite a decline in the late summer stream flow. It's probably partly due to the loss of glaciers. It's also partly due to the earlier snow melt. And it's partly due to changes in the groundwater system that we don't understand very well. Now, along with that, we have increased consumption of water in the South Saskatchewan River, it's primarily in Alberta. But these are the drought years. So there's the drought of 2001, the droughts of the late 1980s. And that's when they're getting up to very, very high percentages of the river water being consumed. Now, there's an agreement between the prairie provinces that Alberta would have to pass on 50% of its natural flows to Saskatchewan. And as you see, we're getting up in the over 40% area several times. So they're getting dangerously close in times of drought. And a real concern we have is that in the next drought, Alberta may not be able to keep that use under 50% we'd see the uh, failure of the Prairie Provinces Water Apportionment Agreement in such a condition. And that would mean very, very intense discussions uh, between the governments and Saskatchewan needs to have a, uh, some idea of what it's going to do if that occurs, and particularly how to prevent it from occurring. So in terms of flow of the major rivers, uh, just to review, the upstream mountain water is driven by changes in snow accumulation. Um, and the snow cover period, we appear to have a, a shift to earlier snow cover and, um, and earlier snow melt, and there's a possibility of vastly reduced snow cover with further warming. Downstream river flow is being reduced by consumption in the river. We need to have some idea how much this might change in the future. Uh, these are some results that Al Petronero, Brenda Toth, and some others at the uh, Environment Canada have done simulating what the South Saskatchewan River might behave like in the uh, uh, late 21st century. And I call your attention really to the South Saskatchewan at Diefenbaker. The range of model results suggested it could be down 22% or up 8%. But on average, they're suggesting a drop of about 8.5% in the annual flow. They also suggest a shift to earlier flows as well, which puts a strain on the operation of Lake Diefenbaker. Realize also that the river has dropped about 12% since the early 20th century. So we're looking at a total of a 20% decline in the natural flows from 1912 to the late 21st century. That's some idea. So there's a decline going on. It's not a vast decline. It's not like we're losing half the river flow or anything like that. But it's enough that it's worrisome because of the uh, increased use that we have intended for this river. And also, I want to caution you that these are very, very preliminary results. There's tremendous uncertainty in the magnitudes and the directions of these fluxes. So what can we say about policy implications on this? Um, we have changing hydrology, and a lot of our water resource uh, designs have been based upon statistics developed from previous hydrology. Uh, these statistics presume something called stationarity, which is a constant climate and constant land use, and we clearly don't have this anymore. So traditional risk management approaches for designing culverts or bridges or dams or operating water supply um, systems no longer going to work. We're going to have to improve our game as to how we model the flows in these rivers using hydrological models, climate models, water use models. We don't have enough data to do this. The observational networks are inadequate. We need to make better use of these through data simulation techniques, satellite techniques, other forms of information, enhance observations through research areas where we can.
the, uh, we have to also deal with evolving unknowns. We really don't know much about groundwater systems in the mountains and foothills, and that could come back and bite us, so we have to really improve our knowledge there. We have a very simple water apportionment mechanism in Western Canada, and that might prove to be insufficient under a severe drought, um, and is probably insufficient for river basin management under the kinds of populations and economic activity we anticipate in this province and in Alberta over the next few decades. So what I'd suggest is that we need to do what many other jurisdictions do, some sort of integrated river basin management that is crossing provincial uh, and uh, territorial boundaries. Uh, we need to ensure fair distribution of water as a population grows. We need to ensure the in-stream flow needs for the aquatic ecosystems are protected. And we want to ensure the security of our food and energy supplies in Western Canada. Now, that's going to be difficult, and that can't be done by simple rules like 50% being passed on or first in time, first in right. So concluding, we're not in a water crisis. We're not yet in a water crisis. If we have one, it's going to be flooding in a few weeks. Uh, but we have the chance to avert a water crisis. And Canada has an exemplary reputation in averting crises before they come. Uh, remember, we sent out the Palliser expedition before we settled the West. We uh, have often done things the right way. And it would be great if we were one of the first countries on Earth to put in a proper water management framework before we have a disaster instead of after we have the disaster. Look at Australia. It, uh, we've managed so far to make a very fragmented system of water management between the provinces, the federal government, and local agencies work uh, because we have a remarkable uh, collaborative approach. However, we have to realize that might fail under extreme drought. And between climate change and rising population, our available water supplies are dwindling, and they're going to make our current institutions for apportioning that water inadequate in the future. I suggest integrated river basin management is one approach for dealing with this, and it will require better information support in order to um, predict the water supply in order to manage it uh, to the level of precision that we're going to need. That's all I have to say, and uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gober. Thank you, John, for those, all the information and the sobering conclusions. I'd now like to uh, uh, introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Pat uh, Patricia Gober. Uh, Dr. Gober received a PhD in geography from the Ohio State University and served uh, as a faculty member at Arizona State in the School of Geo Geo Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning until December of 2010. She's currently a professor in the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy here at the University of Saskatchewan, and she's a research professor in the School of Geographical Sciences, Urban Planning at Arizona State. In addition to all of that, she's director of the National Science Foundation's Decision Center for a Desert City, which studies water management decisions in the face of growing climate uncertainty in the Phoenix area. Her current research centers on issues of water management and environmental change, and she's particularly interested in the use of science and visualization for real-world decision-making. Her most recent book is Metropolitan Phoenix, Placemaking and Community Building in the Desert. It was published in 2006 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. And in April of 2011, this year, she will receive the Association of American Geographers Presidential Achievement Award. Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Gober. Thanks, Michael, for that uh, kind introduction, and John, for a great setup for uh, what I have to say today. Uh, let me identify myself first as a social scientist. So I'm interested in climate change and uncertainty from a social science perspective. I'm interested in how people perceive climate change. I'm interested in the capacity of societal institutions to accommodate climate change and uncertainty. I'm interested also in how we learn to make better decisions in the face of inevitable uncertainty about the climate. So I'll talk less about the physical aspects of climate change and more about the way uh, we respond um, effectively or ineffectively to climate change in my comments about Phoenix. Uh, why should Canadians care 
about uh, Arizona and Phoenix. I would suggest there are two major reasons why uh, what I have to say about water management and Phoenix might be relevant to this particular audience. First, if you search the web, you will see 50 of these advertisements. Uh, for the first time uh, recently, uh, Canada outstrips California as being a major buyer of Phoenix real estate. You might be interested in whether your investments are safe in Phoenix. And I think secondly, uh, it is, and, and John alluded to this, uh, uh, I, uh, Phoenix is a um, uh, over allocate or lives, or Phoenix obtains its water from uh, watersheds that are completely allocated at this point. Uh, and you are quickly approaching that point. Um, I will argue that that requires us to think like adults um, rather than think as teenagers and there, there are always water there to be um, to support population growth and economic development. In our situation in central Arizona, uh, population growth and economic development comes with some difficult and, and adult choices about um, where we will, how, where the water would come from in an over-allocated system. Will it come from agriculture, uh, energy production, mining? Uh, will it come from recreation? Will it come from our hedge uh, against the uncertainty of climate change? So it involves some very difficult choices, and I think those are the choices that uh, we will face here in the Saskatchewan Basin as well. So I'd like to do three things today. John talked about Hydrology 101. Well, I want to give you a little feel for Phoenix 101, uh, because I'd like you to understand the context in which uh, climate change will be experienced and the context in which uh, climate uh, decisions about climate change will be, uh, will, will be faced. Secondly, I want to talk uh, uh, share with you what the climate models say. Uh, in short, there's a great deal of uncertainty um, about uh, uh, the, the future of the watersheds that deliver water to, to Phoenix. And thirdly, I'd like to talk about the major policy challenges um, that uh, confront us in, uh, in, in central Arizona with or without climate change. Um, so I'm too going to talk about a fragmented water basin. I'm going to talk about um, uh, the fact that rural Arizona is in a world of hurt because of the way uh, policies about water. I'm going to talk about the fact that we, what we, um, our, our policies for groundwater and surface water are separate despite the science of an uh, integrated uh, uh, wa water system. I'd like to talk about the fact that we set aside not one drop of water for environmental purposes. Water is perceived in central Arizona as a commodity. Um, and it is put to its highest and best use, and some of the long-term implications, some of the short-term, some of the current implications of, of that kind of policy. And, and, and finally, I want to talk about the relationship between um, water and energy and heat, um, and, and ask uh, what water shortages may manifest itself in the Phoenix area in all kinds of ways, and in one way I'd like to suggest is the urban heat island. So first, how is it possible to put uh, four million people um, in a very arid region with uh, 187 millimeters of precipitation, 7.4 inches of precipitation? How is it possible, how is it even thinkable that four million people live there? That's the case because Phoenix has a large hydraulic reach. Um, so Phoenix has an exceptional geography's everything. Um, it has this uh, spatial imperative. So Phoenix sits at the uh, base of a, uh, a, a set of watersheds and uh, obtains water from more humid um, uh, upstream uh, m mountainous regions. Um, and it is for that reason that you can you can put four million people in a place like this and think about putting far more there in the future. This is the reason um, Phoenix was first settled, and it is that spatial imperative that led to a large prehistoric civilization that lived in the Phoenix region between 0 and 1450 AD, uh, based on irrigation agriculture from, that, um, from those upstream watersheds. So at the peak, this civilization in, um, in 
included uh, 40,000 people were living in the Phoenix Basin in 1200 uh, AD. 110,000 acres uh, were of irrigated agriculture were being um, um, deployed. Um, this civilization um, all but disappeared by, uh, by 1450. Uh, archaeologists think because they didn't handle changes in the climate particularly well. Uh, we don't call Phoenix, it's not called Phoenix for nothing. It's because a modern city uh, rose from the ashes of this prehistoric uh, Hoho Kam civilization. And we like to think about what we might learn from the experiences of this civilization as we move forward in an era of climate uncertainty and, and, and climate change. So like you, we live in a, in a, um, in a watershed of high uh, annual variability in, uh, in stream flows. And you're looking at the uh, variability in our upstream watersheds, um, uh, uh, the annual variability. And in the Western United States, we deal with that variability by building infrastructure. We build big dams like the Roosevelt uh, Dam sitting on, your, uh, on, the, uh, on the slide in front of you. Um, it is significant, I think, that uh, uh, Roosevelt Dam was closed in March 2000, or 1911, um, almost 100 years ago to this day. Uh, and we managed water with this infrastructure by enlarging, ever enlarging our infrastructure um, by our, ever enlarging our infrastructure by building more dams um, and more reservoirs and um, better and better manage the um, climate variability that's, uh, that appears on the, on the left side of that slide. Um, that, those dams, that reservoir, those, um, uh, the, the water sitting behind them supported first a, a large agricultural, modern agricultural society in Phoenix in 1950, the Phoenix area was the third most prosperous agricultural uh, county in the United States. Uh, cotton, alfalfa, feedlots, uh, uh, citrus, uh, uh, a major agricultural region. After World War II, we transitioned from that agricultural society um, to an urban society. We use lots of water. We throw a lot of water on, uh, uh, on the city of Phoenix, uh, probably for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because um, that oasis kind of mentality uh, cools the very, very hot desert uh, city of, of Phoenix. And secondly, because uh, our uh, forefathers sought to create an urban environment that looked an awful lot like what the migrants to Phoenix expected, the migrants of Phoenix coming from the eastern and the midwestern parts of the United States. So we created an urban environment that was very familiar to people from the, from the outside and used quite a lot of water in order to, to do it. Uh, we sit now at 4 million people and anticipate and the projections show that we'll grow to 9 million people by 2050. So the, uh, w where will the water come from to support this kind of growth? Well, if you sit down and talk to the water managers, they'll say, we have in Phoenix historically about two, we th talk about acre feet. So uh, we have about 2.3 million acre feet. Uh, an acre foot supports a family of four people in an urban society. So 2.3 times four uh, equals nine million people. So with today's water supply, um, it's not out of the, with more uh, careful use of water, it's not all, uh, out of the realm of, uh, of uh, being reasonable that, uh, that we would be able to support nine million people. That's, of course, without climate change. Uh, where will the water come from? There'll be a continued uh, transition from agriculture to urban. Uh, the blue line uh, shows the uh, trajectory for uh, water use for agricultural purposes, and the red line shows for urban purposes. The lines cross in about 2000. And today, about a third of the water in the Phoenix area is used for um, agricultural purposes. There's still, um, there's still some left. We would anticipate um, water also, additional water coming from uh, conservation purposes. This is, or from conservation, this is the city of Phoenix's uh, per capita water use uh, with relatively modest uh, conservation efforts. These uh, uh, per capita water use has declined over time with, uh, um, with uh, more efficient uh, household appliances, with drip irrigation systems, with relatively uh, modest uh, conservation efforts. 
And then thirdly, where have we gotten water and where we think we're going to get the, the water to support future growth from an enlarged um, spatial infrastructure. By increasing that spatial imperative that's always uh, provided the growth to support Phoenix. So in the 1960s, um, Phoenix uh, or the A Arizona uh, sought funding from the federal government to build the Central Arizona Project Canal to link the rapidly growing cities in Central Arizona, Phoenix and Tucson, to vast new um, water supplies along the western part of the state along the Colorado River. Um, and we, uh, the uh, Central Arizona Project was constructed during the 1980s and it now delivers a sizable, um, uh, about a million acre feet a year, contributes about 40% of, of Phoenix's uh, current water supply to, uh, um, to, to the region. So we've, we've, we've we're, we're assuming or the people in Phoenix assume that they're going to use this uh, Colorado River water to support continued growth um, and, uh, and um, ur urban development. This is what scares people in central Arizona. Um, this is Lake Mead um, and the bathtub rings on Lake Mead, major um, uh, uh, reservoir holding about 25 million acre feet of water in the, uh, along the Colorado River. Uh, Lake Mead is down to, um, as, of, uh, as of today, it's at 43% of capacity, and there are many climatologists and hydrologists who think that Lake Mead will never be filled again um, because of the effects of climate change along that whole Colorado River Basin that I showed you on the previous, uh, uh, on the previous map. So all bets are off um, if, uh, if climate change reduces the uh, um, uh, stream flows uh, of, of the Colorado River. This is especially significant for Arizona because in order to obtain the federal loan to produce or to build this infrastructure, the Central Arizona Project, uh, Arizona made uh, a deal with the devil. Uh, in order to win the support of the California, um, the 800 pound gorilla in our backyard, in order to obtain the, the, um, the support of California, Arizona agreed to junior rights to Colorado River water. That means if there's a shortage on the Colorado, California will continue to get its full share and Arizona will take the full hit. Arizona agreed to this in 1968. Who knew about climate change in 1968? The ramifications of this agreement are coming clearer um, uh, in, in a variety of ways um, to us these days. When we take the global climate models and begin to downscale them for both the, um, the, the upstream watersheds um, adjacent to Phoenix and the Colorado, our two most important sources of, um, of surface water, we see the same as John uh, reported to you earlier. There's tremendous uncertainty in the um, precipitation there's pretty general agreement that it will be warmer. There is a very wide uh, range of predictions regarding what it will do to our stream flows and our water supplies. Uh, just to give you a feel for that, with our upstream watersheds, the, the models produce anything from 19% of historical flows to 123% of historical flows. Climate uncertainty indeed. Um, the models for the Colorado River produce anything from about 60% of historical flows to 120% uh, uh, of, of historical flows. So we face a great deal of uncertainty and it's, it's very critical for us because of, of where we sit in terms of, uh, in, in terms of our, our lack of priority over Colorado River flows. Um, we've done, in my research center, we've done some uh, uh, work about what that means. How do we take those, um, those model results and translate it to what does it mean on a gallons per capita per day basis in, in, in Phoenix? What kinds of adjustments would we have to make under different kinds of uh, climate change conditions? And <clears throat> I think the, the kind of the, 
the, uh, as we look at this, this information, it's clear to us that uh, some kind of a policy action would be required in Phoenix, even if there isn't, um, even if we had 100% of, of historical flows, to be able to accommodate the kind of growth that's projected in, in central Arizona. Um, it's also the case that even, even Phoenix can make some adaptations um, to, uh, to climate change uh, through lifestyle, outdoor water use, indoor conservation, um, managing growth, building a, um, a, a, a denser city than, than what we have now, um, uh, and, and, and survive um, even uh, with some moderate uh, kind of uh, uh, levels of, uh, uh, of climate change. So the, new, the news is not all that, that bad. There are many, because again, because we use so much water outside and because we still have water from agriculture, there is some room for us to um, make some adjustments to, to climate change. The most dire, the 19% scenarios will be, you, you won't have nine million people living in Phoenix under those kinds of, uh, those kinds of conditions. I would argue, though, today that the um, that 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 climate change is a, is a major challenge for future water supplies in, in, in Phoenix. But they are not. But it is not the, the major challenge. the The major challenges are the policy change, the policy changes that that need to be made with or without climate change. Uh, and, and so we need not sit around and wait in, until we know more about the climate, whether it will be 19% or 123%. There are some um, policy um, challenges that face us that we can begin to solve under any circumstances. And they include, first, the fragmented, and I was interested in John's um, comment on that as well, the fragmented nature of uh, water decision making in, uh, in, in central Arizona. There is not one big bucket of water that is delivered to, to central Arizona. There are 120 different water providers in the metropolitan area. You're looking at a map and the water portfolios of the largest of those water providers. Um, they, th there are, so, so every, every different um, provider, every community has its own uh, uh, source portfolio. Some depend more on the Colorado River, others depend on the upstream watershed, still others are using uh, uh, groundwater as their major, as their major source of, uh, 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 of water. Um, they all have different growth trajectories and growth plans. Some like the large um, uh, city in the middle, the city of Phoenix, have relatively secure portfolios they're unlikely to grow because they're largely surrounded by other, by other communities. And they've done some serious thinking about climate change and planning for 50 years from now um, what would happen under moderate, uh, climate, moderate to severe climate change conditions. Other communities, for example, those on the urban, many on the urban fringe, anticipate growth, an anticipate um, quadrupling in size over the next 50 years. They have insecure sources of water and they, or, and, and they largely depend upon the Colorado River for their, their future water. Um, so in the face of climate change, geography matters. Um, there, are far, there are significant differences from one community to another in the vulnerability of water supplies to climate change. And the current management situation is every man, every community for themselves. Um, and so we enter a period of uncertainty about climate as a, 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 a fragmented 120 piece puzzle rather than as an integrated um, whole. And I think this is a major policy uh, challenge. Climate change will hurt certain communities more than others, and climate change in certain areas will affect certain communities more, more than others. There's a complete lack of uh, uh, regulation of uh, growth in, uh, in, in rural Arizona. In the major parts of uh, uh, urban Arizona, uh, developers are required to have a 100-year assured water supply. 
There are no such uh, um, requirements for rural um, Arizona. In the, for the, in, in the main, uh, communities across outside of these colored areas rely on groundwater um, for their, um, their sources of water. And our, our models show that they will be in serious difficulty um, in the face of, uh, uh, of long-term uh, drought conditions. Uh, and there are no regulations on uh, uh, growth and housing development in, in these areas. I think a third issue that confronts us is the policy separation between groundwater and surface water. They're seen as two, they're seen as two completely different sources of water in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Arizona. And as a result, you can see a development pattern emerging as you see in front of you. You're looking at new well development in the Verde Valley. Some of you may have been to uh, Sedona, right up here. Um, but along the Verde Valley, this is one of the watersheds that contributes water to central Arizona, um, to, to Phoenix. Uh, and you're looking at uh, well development in 1950 and well, the number of uh, uh, wells in 2006. So people, uh, rural development is, um, is based on uh, people digging private wells that are exempt from uh, state supervision. They're digging these wells in the um, adjacent to the river, arguing that they're um, taking groundwater. Um, Phoenix argues that they're taking what essentially will become surface water. Um, and that development like this undermines the capacity of Phoenix then to be able to continue to grow or to be, to be able to hedge against the possibility of climate change given the uncertainty that we face for climate change. So there's an enormous conflicts between urban and rural areas in um, how this, um, this uh, problem will be adjudicated and it will be adjudicated in courts. As I mentioned before, uh, in both the upstream watersheds as well as the Colorado River, um, uh, water is um, in envisioned to be a commodity. Um, um, we're, we're not a kinder, gentler world as, uh, as John described, and 100% uh, of our flows are, are, are allocated for, um, for urban, for agriculture, for mining, for energy de de development. There's no water um, left over for environmental purposes. Um, you're looking at the delta of the Colorado River, which used to receive 17 million acre feet of water per year, that today receives for in all but the rare um, wet year receives none. Um, the long-term consequences of this for ecology, for biodiversity um, are, are, are significant. My colleagues, colleagues are, are talking about this. I'd like to suggest to you in this final policy challenge that, that uh, water shortages may, uh, may present themselves in unusual ways in central Arizona. They may, may not um, appear as water shortages per se. Um, because we have historically cooled, you saw that picture of the oasis, the urban environment with lots of water. One obvious way to save water and adjust to climate change in our case is to um, uh, tr transition these oasis landscapes into, uh, into desert landscapes. In the process, um, a, we, we believe we have some serious implications for an urban heat island effect. You're looking at the spatial properties and the intensity of the urban heat island in Phoenix from 1970 to, uh, to 2006. Um, it's uh, 12 degrees F, 7 degrees C warmer on a hot June night in Phoenix um, today than it was at, at the end of the Second World War. Um, as we begin to conserve water and save, and save water as a hedge against climate change, we could very easily be exacerbating the urban heat island effect and it'll be too hot to live in Phoenix. Um, or it will be too expensive in terms of energy use to cool Phoenix so that it becomes habitable. Are these water shortages? These are water shortages that are presenting themselves in different kinds of ways. And we need to be, we don't, 
we don't um, manage the urban environment, we don't manage energy and water as um, co-joined uh, resources in any way. So, um, what, what are we doing about this in, in central Arizona? I, I, um, um, uh, in my spare time, I, I commute to or, uh, Phoenix maybe once a month because the, uh, to uh, participate in the activities of the Decision Center for Des Desert City, Michael managed or Michael mentioned. And what we've done, I think we've done two things. In the, in the right-hand picture, we've uh, developed a water simulation model. And we take the position that we, not, we can't sit and wait until we find out uh, we can reconcile the problems of, uh, of climate change. We need to decide what kind of a, a city we want to be, be and take the policy decisions um, to get to what kind of a future we, we want. Um, and so we've built a, it's just a fancy water budget model, supply and demand, and on that supply and demand, we impose different um, uh, policy decisions, different climate change conditions, and then we think about what, is it, what does it mean in terms of water availability, and what does it mean in terms of urban landscapes of, uh, of Phoenix. And we hope to be able to, uh, we facilitate conversations about uh, the future and what kind of future we want in the face of, again, um, a profound uncertainty about our climate. And then on the other side, on, on, on the left, we hold uh, workshops. Uh, where we've got, uh, in this picture, we've got scientists, um, 15 scientists and 15 water managers, and the scientists present the results of their science, and the water managers say, I don't understand that at all. Um, there's so much uncertainty, it doesn't help me make decisions. Um, and we come to some deeper understanding of the needs of the various um, uh, decision makers in this process and the way science can better support um, decision making about the uh, about the future and so we don't we don't get um, uh, crippled um, by the uh, uncertainty but rather uh, motivated by it so uh, I guess that's my uh, I, I, I think I think climate uncertainty is a is a, uh, it's, uh, it, it's in some ways it's, it's our reason to be. Um, but I think we've come to the realization that um, there's not a whole lot we're gonna be able to do about that envelope of uh, uh, uncertainty, but there are still an awful lot of decisions that can be made um, that will make a life an awful lot easier for an awful lot of people, um, um, irrespective, of, even, even though we don't know about climate change. So I'll stop there. And Thank you.